Hi everybody. We're going to do something a little bit different on this video. First of all, I am narrating some of this video from my desktop computer upstairs, which is going to be fraught with great danger, uh, as you can imagine, with between Bella, between my kids, between my wife, uh, everybody. Who knows what kind of background noises you're going to hear. But we're going to try. <laughs> See how many takes it takes to do this. Uh, second of all, we're going to look at a project that I am not working on, but rather one of my patron, patrons is working on. And what you see in front of you right now is a very rare amplifier in and of itself. It is a George Gott model G50 or G50U. There's a couple different versions floating around out there. This is a pretty rare animal here. It's from a company called Big of California, or BOC. No, not that BOC. <laughs> and uh, they were a company that was around only for a few years. They're based out of California, as, you, as the name implies. And you're looking at, they, they had a bunch of, uh, products out there. First product I believe was a preamp and it was based on the Macintosh C8 preamplifier and a lot of their designs were based on other designs. Most of their power amplifiers like the one you see in front of you were based on the Williamson amplifier design. So it's very uh, classic basic type push-pull amplifier design and we'll go over that in a little bit. That's not what this is about though. <laughs> I got an email from one of my patrons as I said and he indicated to me that he had purchased a amplifier similar to this one but when he got it it was different. It had a different faceplate on it and it had in uh, Sharpie marker, it had a different model number written on it. And there's almost no information whatsoever about it. So it's kind of a mystery amplifier. And it appears as if it was a experimental prototype, perhaps George Gott himself, who is apparently an employee uh, with Macintosh Laboratories before he came to work for Big of California and I don't even know if he was the owner of BOC or if he was an employee with BOC. I, I don't know. It's, it's, this, this whole thing is filled with mystery. I don't, there's very little information about this company, their employees or anything to be found out there. So anyway, he sends me this picture and this email, and I'll show you here what it looks like. So right here is the amplifier that he has. And if you noticed, it looks kind of similar to the first one we looked at, which was that G50, which was a mono block amplifier. It was a mono amplifier. But this one very clearly says stereo 50. Now, I thought that was kind of interesting, and so did he. And looking at it though you only have two output tubes and you have two transformers one of course is going to be your power transformer and the other one is the output transformer so how can this thing be stereo is there another piece to it or or what this is where the video gets really really interesting first let's look at the close-up of the faceplate of the G50 G50, this is a G50D. And there's four knobs and two switches. On the left, you have your input level, which is kind of like your volume control. You have a switch that says test and operate. You have a dynamic balance adjustment and a static balance adjustment. What the heck are those? and then you have a damping factor in and out switch and then you have a damping factor adjustment now damping factor adjustable damping factor is nothing new uh, 
there are other amplifiers, especially some of the uh, solid state. I'm forgetting the name of them right off the top of my head, but they were known to have damping factor, adjustable damping factor knobs. But anyway, as you can see, this is kind of a strange bird <laughs> of an amplifier. And if you look at the faceplate of the amplifier that Greg has, it very clearly says Stereo 50. But if you look at the two boxes that I outlined, in green and in red, in green you can see somebody wrote GD-108. But to the right of it, you can see that it says G50D. And you can see on the faceplate itself, it very clearly says Stereo 50. It has all the same openings where the original controls were, but now it has a new overlaid faceplate, and it has a left channel and right channel uh, control. It has an input stereo and mono control. It has a static balance, and it has a convergence adjustment and it has an output stereo and mono. So it has stereo or mono input and stereo or mono output switches and the balance knobs are different and there's right and left channel input volume instead of just input volume. And there's really no record of this amplifier in existence anywhere that I could find anywhere online or any kind of forum or any place. So this amp is truly a mystery. So this begs the question, where did, the, where did this thing come from and why does it say stereo on it, but yet the layout is different. Now, if you look to the amplifier on the right, this is an original G50. And one of the things you'll notice is that it has the octal type tubes that you would normally see in a Williamson amplifier, the 6SN7s. And to my understanding, they did make a later model or version of this, this uh, G50 monoblock that did use the miniature tubes and I believe it used a 12AX7 and a 12AU7. And that's what they were using uh, in place of these two 6SN7s. And there's Bella barking at a image of a dog on the television. <laughs> now finding decent images of any of these amplifiers is very difficult because of how old they are and how rare they are and <laughs> how few of them were built and how little information there is. But if you look to the left, here is an advertisement of a pair of the G50 monoblocks that were up for sale. And you can see the underneath how they were built. And if you compare that to the one that Greg got, uh, you know, and, and that he picked up, you can see that they're very different and the biggest thing is they both have the selenium rectifier for the negative bias voltage for the outputs but if you look there's two little transformers on his that you don't see on the other ones there to the left and this is interesting because when you see what these are in a minute uh, it's really going to get interesting. But take a good look at it. Now, this amplifier, as Greg acquired it, was in, in a non-functioning condition. In other words, someone had worked on it, and we're not even sure if it worked ever, or if this was just something in the middle of its, um, you know, in the middle of experimentation, and they gave up on it, or if it actually worked, and somebody had just done further experimenting on it or someone had tried to maybe restore it back to a monoblock. We don't know. He doesn't know. So let's start by looking at the schematic of the original G50 or the G50D as they call it. The first thing you'll notice is that the 
tubes that they're that are using in the front end of this are a 12AX7 and a 12AU7. Unlike uh, the one that we saw in the images there earlier, where they're using the 6SN7s that were used in the original Williamson amplifiers. Now I keep saying the word Williamson. Uh, I any of you who don't know what I'm talking about with that, DT Williamson was an engineer back I believe either in the 1940s or so and he was one of the first ones to introduce global negative feedback in an amplifier and to come up with this particular design. Many of the push-pull vacuum tube amplifiers that came out afterwards used a lot of the concepts that he developed in this particular amplifier of his. And there's there's a little book that you can purchase uh, called the Williamson Amplifier. It's only maybe 20 pages long. It's a little like a almost like a magazine, and it's extraordinarily interesting. Tells the story of of uh, his amplifier, a little bit about him, and how it works and so forth. But anyway, this is a modified version of the Williamson, and there are many versions out there that are similar to this. The main differences that you'll see is down below the first the input tube you'll see that dynamic adjustment or dynamic balance pot and then you'll see uh, the damping circuit or the damping factor circuit up in the upper right hand corner of the schematic and those are a couple things that are kind of unique to George Gott uh, G50 <laughs> amplifier here by big of California. But other than that, this is, if you would look at this, you would just say, what's the big deal about it? It's just an amplifier. It's a mono amplifier from the 1950s and 60s, and there's nothing special about it. However, <laughs> let's look at what this other one looks like. Now, before I pop, pop the schematic up there, I want to tell you that Greg did an amazing thing here. He's not a very highly experienced engineer in his words, but he actually was able to look at the components, reverse engineer the way that it was, how he found it, and actually he made a pretty accurate version of the schematic of what the amplifier would have looked like because there are no schematics available for this thing. So you got to commend him for such an amazing job he did when I show you this schematic. So keep that in mind. For those of you who say that you're new to electronics and you're not very good with schematics yet, but you're learning uh, and you just can't do this, <laughs> I want you to pause for a moment and look at this schematic. Greg emailed me and said that he is completely new to electronics, that he's learning and he's still trying to figure things out and so forth. And then he comes up and shows me this schematic that he drew from reverse engineering that messed up looking chassis. And I'm shocked at how close he got this circuit probably. Now if you look at what's going on here, we'll, we'll talk about a little bit of this, but what I would like to do is I'm leaving this up here in case any of you want to take a screenshot of it, but I'm going to go down to the bench and we're going to go on the camera and we're going to walk through this circuit and try to figure out how it would work if it even did work and then try to determine if this thing is for real or not, if this was actually something that George got did himself and if so if he actually was able to make it work and begs the question would this have ever made it to production and I'll give you some of my opinions at the end of this video okay we are down here on the bench now let me turn on some extra light I don't know how helpful it will be but we'll find out are we gonna get shutter roll from that yeah we are a little bit too much Okay, so here's the schematic, and if you notice, some really strange things are going on here. Now they still have the 12AX7 as the first tube, and the 12AU7 as the second tube, 
but in a standard Williamson amplifier what you will see is one half of this first tube will be a voltage amplifier the second one will be your phase splitter or your phase inverter circuit and, and it's a cathodyne type phase inverter much like the Fisher 800B that we're working on right now and then you have the 12AU7 is an extra voltage gain stage and those, those are called the drivers and those drivers each one will drive one of the output tubes. Now that is not what's going on with this schematic. If you look one half of the 12AX7 is used for the left input for left channel and the other half is used for the right channel input. So these are both voltage amplification stages. And if you look, the ground or the common point for the cathode, if, if it is connected right now directly to ground, you can see. Now here's where I think we may have some issues. Again, Greg said that some of these wires had been moved around and so we're speculating at where everything was but what it looks like is when you're operating in stereo mode I don't think this is connected to ground like this but it might be all right I think this the common part of the switch goes to this line and then the X would be one contact like you know normally open or whatever you want to call it and then the because it's a double throw switch and then the other end would be uh, to this pot up here we'll get more into what this is later so like I said parts of this schematic even though they were drawn as they were seen as the amplifier was found he documented it which was he did a fantastic job on this we can tell from this probably what they were doing so really all this is when it's in stereo mode is these are just two individual voltage amplifiers here's the weird thing the second stage that it goes to is not a phase splitter if you look the way that it would be configured right now coming off of the plate of this channel you're driving this tube coming off to the plate off of the plate of this channel you're driving this tube so now this looks like another gain stage so now you have one gain stage and a second gain stage but we're gonna get more into this here in a minute <laughs> then we come out of the plate or the anode of these two tubes and in a very traditional fashion we go through our coupling capacitors and we go into the control grids of our outputs which are EL34s and we've all seen EL34s before and then this thing is wired up at least as it looks right now it's wired up for ultralinear mode what is ultralinear well let's just start by saying look it up you can google search that it's easier than me doing a kind of getting off track on this but this is a common circuit design so it's not something you can't look up easily but it's an ultra linear circuit doesn't really have much to do with this though then we see it, the output transformer looks pretty traditional except it has two center points and I don't believe this is correct here I believe that there are two separate windings so imagine just having this without without it being connected between here and here so there would be two center points and they're being tied together like this so that you can separate these or put them together now in this instance they're being tied together why is that well I believe this is a special output transformer in a similar fashion to the way Macintosh winds their output transformers this probably is a bifiler wound transformer oh boy Tony what are you getting into with this <laughs> what is a bifiler transformer well kinda long story short look at this coil of solder here for a minute 
And if you look, if I take this, the end of this solder, and I unwind it back to this point, we have this much wire, correct? However, in this, and that would be one turn, right? So that's one turn. However, the coil that's wound at the core, very in the center, if we did one turn of it, kind of like this, I'm doing this on camera, it's only this long, right? So we have one turn of wire when it's in the middle is this long, and one turn of wire when it's on the outside is this long. However, as far as an inductor is concerned, both of them equal one turn. That's very important. The turns ratio doesn't really care, at least uh, from our perspective right now. The turns ratio doesn't care how long the turn is, just so there is one turn around the core. The problem is, when we get into the DC world. This length of wire has more resistance than this length of wire. So if you ever took a push-pull output transformer like one of these and you measured from the inside winding, the beginning winding, to the center tap, so let's call this one the beginning to the center tap, each of those turns is smaller, right? So it uses less wire to make the same number of turns. And then if you measure from here to here, even though it's the same number of turns, the length of wire is longer. So because you have a shorter piece of wire here and a longer piece of wire here, this one's going to have a lower DC resistance. Have any of you ever taken a normal output transformer uh, in an amplifier and measured that. Do you ever notice when you're trying to measure your, your plate current and you, you do the thing where you measure the voltage drop across here and you measure the, the resistance, the static res DC resistance of the coil? Do you ever notice one side is higher resistance than the other? That's why. But with Macintosh and what I believe is also going on with this one, instead of winding it just starting at the beginning and just winding on top of one another until you get to this end, what they do is they take two pieces of wire at the same time and they wind them around like this. And what ends up happening is since both of these coils from here to here and from here to here are being wound side by side next to one another, they end up both being the same length. And then all they do is they tie the two ends together here in the middle, and that's your center tap. But what ends up happening is the two wires end up being the same DC resistance and the same physical length. Now, turns ratio works the same as it does with this one, so that part doesn't matter. But when it comes to the DC resistance, they're the same. And those can have some pretty dramatic effects in certain circuitry. I believe that's going to be important to this when we find out why this thing works or how this thing works. Now in the normal amplifier you would have this black wire on the secondary of the transformer going to ground. And you would have then your 4 ohm, your 8 ohm, and your 16 ohm tap. And they would be going to the speaker terminals, right? But let's back up again and look what they did here. There is no ground here. In other words, this coil is not tied to ground. Instead, one end of it goes to this part of the output. The other end goes to this output. The 16 ohm tap goes to this pot, which is a 1K potentiometer. And they, they refer to ground <laughs> externally. So this is a balanced circuit. Now, why would you do that, you might say? Well, what they're doing 
in a nutshell, is they're playing around with the different phases. Let's walk through here. I'm going to draw in my little schematic here. At the input, let's say I put this signal here and I put this signal here. Right? They're both the same. And let's just say that they're both in phase with one another. So let's say these are both the same signal. They're tied together. Now, when this when the signal starts to go positive, okay, so here's zero volts, right? And let's say this is one volt and this is minus one volt, okay? We'll just do that, or negative one volt. That signal is going to snake its way through here and it's going to get onto this grid. When this becomes more positive, it's going to make the grid more positive, right? Just like that. When we make the grid more positive, we turn the tube on more. It conducts more. So this voltage is going to go lower. It's going to go down. So what we're going to see here is even though this one's going positive, this signal will go more negative. So what happens is the signal is inverted. And the same thing's going to happen here. The signal's going to go more positive first, right, at the beginning. And therefore, the anode here will, be go, will begin to go more negative. So again, whatever you put on this end is going to be inverted at this end. It's also going to be higher amplitude, but it's going to be inverted. So the same thing's going to happen here. I'm going to have a negative signal now, right? So it's going to be inverted. So it's going to start going negative and then go positive. And then it's going to invert itself again. So then this one's going to go back to here again. And this is going to do the same thing. You follow what I'm saying so far? We have to follow this through. When this comes through here, let's ignore our bias circuit for a moment. The same thing is going to happen when I put a signal like this here. I'm going to get another inverted signal up here. And I'm going to get another inverted signal down here. Why am I doing all this? Well, we have to be able to follow this to see what's going on. Here's the problem. <laughs> what happens if this side goes more negative at the same time this side goes more negative? Ask yourself that for a second what's going to happen is these two signals are going to cancel one another out pretty much. In other words, you're going to get a very distorted, weird looking signal, aren't we? If we get anything at all. So how can this thing work like this, you might say? Well, here's where things get interesting. Looking down here, we have this funny little transformer. Remember I brought your attention to two transformers at the bottom of the chassis of this GD108? Well, the first one is pretty common. It's, it's a choke. And all this is here for is for filtering to make, to, to give you a, a quieter DC, a better, cleaner DC signal. Okay, so it comes out of the rectifier. This is a Pi network. Instead of a resistor here, it's a inductor but it's still a Pi network. You have a capacitor, a coil, and a capacitor. And then when we come out of the output, we go through this thing that's called a common mode signal recovery transformer. What on earth is that? Well, if you look, 
they're taking the B plus, the filtered B plus, it goes through this coil or through the primary of this funny little transformer and then it finds its way up to the center point of the primary of the output transformer. But here's where it gets interesting. On the secondary of this transformer, we're actually tying in to this lead right here, which is your 4 ohm tap. And again, I think this switch is not wired properly on this schematic, but it's as he found it, okay? So somebody had already tried to move things around. I'm not sure why, but anyway, and then it comes out and it becomes your ground. Take a look at that. It's ties to ground. Now, what's happening is when we put these signals in here, it's going to change the current in this circuit. All right? So all of this is going to, to the whole, the change in current and in voltage from this inductor is going to impose a similar signal onto this. That's going to have an output here, which is going to either add or subtract to this secondary, depending on which one of these we're, we're dealing with, whether it's this side of the winding or this side of the winding. So you see, this becomes your common mode, your common mode point or your common point, and these two coils become a differential pair. So when one of them is going positive, one's going negative. And one of them's always going to block the negative going waveform, the other is always going to block the positive. So essentially what you're going to see, and I'm still wrapping my mind around this myself, so forgive me if I'm not explaining it properly, but what you're going to have up here is you're going to have a the equivalent of what would be like a single-ended amplifier. So think of this as two single-ended amplifiers that are sharing a common transformer and each one is canceling the influence of the other out. So any signals that are common to these two will be canceled out by this common mode signal transformer. And any signal that's not common to one another between these will make it out to these two different outputs. So, in other words, whatever I do here is going to come out here. And whatever I do here is going to come out here. And it's because this transformer, working with this transformer, is going to cancel out the additive effect of these two tubes. I'm not sure if I explain that correctly. I, I don't know how to put it into words. I'm not doing a very good job, I'm sure. But I, th you could kind of con kind of think of this as how multiplex works in FM, but it's not. Multiplex FM is different, but it's the same idea where you have when you have phase relationships where the f the phases cancel out a common mode signal and only allow the differences out. If that makes sense. So you know how you have your left plus right and your left minus right. And, and then you have, um, they, you compare the two of them and when you subtract them, you get left and right, or you'll get two left and two right, or plus two left and minus two right, or whatever, okay? It's a similar thing to what they're doing here. Now, here's where they're calling this static balance. This is really, your bias balance or your DC offset adjustment. So on a standard Williamson amplifier, they had two pots here. One was would adjust the actual uh, bias voltage, so you can set the bias level on this. This one's fixed. Um, normally you would have a pot down here to adjust that, but that doesn't matter. A lot of them don't have adjustable bias. And then you have a balance pot, and what that does is let's say these two tubes are a little bit different gain. This allows you to, to offset that a little bit so they're both perfectly balanced at standby. Now I know I made a comment on the Fisher 
800 series where I, I'm not really into this sort of thing because even though they're balanced when the amp is sitting in idle they unbalance the, the closer you get to driving into clipping. In this instance we don't care about that. It's more important <laughs> that these tubes are perfectly balanced at idle because think about it if either one of them uh, has has a different voltage level than the other okay if they don't equal exactly zero this is not going to work so this becomes a critical adjustment and that's why this is normally a pot that you would adjust on the chassis of your amplifier you know it's, it's a calibration you do when you set the amp up and then you forget about it you leave it but in this one this pot is on the face plate of the amplifier because they you actually have to physically adjust this to be perfect I'm just speculating here. <laughs> After st I stared at this for a long time trying to figure out what what they're trying to do. Now where this comes in and this is really interesting is we have these two switches. You have your input stereo and mono and you have your output stereo and mono. And I believe you would need to switch both of these switches for it to work in either direction. They both have to be switched into mono or both in stereo. If you had one one way and the other the other way, I'm not sure what it would do. I don't know if it would work. But here's the thing. When you switch these into mono mode, that's where this pot comes into play. Because now this pot is going to take this common mode signal and loop it back into here and it's actually going to create your phase shift on one side so this becomes a phase inverter and by adjusting this pot it's adjusting how much you're feeding back into the channel to create the out of phase condition between these two pots so you have to balance them you're basically converging <laughs> the, the, the input uh, from the to these so that you have a perfect uh, out of phase signal on each side so this is critical for mono mode if I'm understanding what they're doing correctly because if you notice there's an X down here there's an X up here and there's an X back here and then this pot has the three X's on it and what I think is going on is I think they're taking feedback from the outputs right here at this 16 ohm tap they're all tying it back to this input and they're use this this particular control won't work at that point I don't think and this becomes your inverted signal if if I'm understanding this correctly and these switches here I'm not sure how we would wire them but they're probably taking this common mode signal and removing it so that this works like a normal output section then. At least that's what I think. It's a mystery. My question is if George Gott, who is the engineer with uh, BOC, if this was his project, something he was experimenting with, this amplifier that Greg has might be the only one in existence. It may be a prototype that they actually experimented with. And my question is, how did it come up for sale? How did he get it? And did it really work at some point in time? This is where I get a little bit, you know, <laughs> for me, I don't know. And I'm not, I, we would really have to use this scope and everything and do a lot of signal tracing to understand this to see if it's possible and if it actually worked. Now I do know that other people did experimenting with using a common output transformer and getting a stereo signal out. I know this is not a unique thing to this. Others have tried and were successful to some degree in getting it to work. My question is did this circuit work? Did he get it to work? And if so, was it just that it was unstable and unreliable? Did the company go out of business too soon before he could perfect this and put it into production? 
or did they just abandon the project and say well you don't really save enough money by saving one transformer and some tubes nobody's gonna want this I don't know it's a big mystery this is the kind of stuff that fascinates me this is the kind of stuff that I like to think about because this is how how you challenge your mind and learn new ways of thinking and new ways of working with circuits so even though we're looking at ancient technology it's old vacuum tube amplifiers from the 1950s look how look how complicated this can be and how interesting it can be you know we don't need to look at some modern digital thing <laughs> to uh, to be challenged there's a lot of challenge right here so I'm gonna leave this video up to you guys look at this think about it talk about it go down in the comments section and let me know what you think let me know where I'm wrong on this because I know I am and let me know some of your thoughts let's pull our minds together and see if we can answer those questions did this amp exist beyond that one that Greg has from my patreon channel if so does did the, did they get this thing to work and was the GD 108 just a concept num model number or was this a real production run I don't know hard to tell definitely doesn't look like like that first one that you know the one we're looking at <laughs> was a production model but I'd love to know more about this any of you who know any of this stuff any of you who knew who know more info about big of California or George Gott or this particular design please come down in the comments and let us know because it's really got me stumped and it's really got me interested this is the kind of stuff I love to do so we're gonna leave this video at this and as always I'm gonna wish you all peace joy happiness and good health and I'm gonna let you know that in a couple more days the rest of the parts are going to be in for this uh, Fisher 800B and we'll be back on this project but I thought in the meantime this would be really fascinating and I hope some of the things that I threw out there will help uh, Greg because he wants to actually restore this to its original design and get it to work and I applaud him for taking on such a difficult project and uh, I'm gonna do everything in my power to help him achieve that I don't want to do it I want him to do it I want to see him succeed so I'm gonna help him in any way I can and this is this video is the first the first part of that that I'll do and we're gonna correspond back and forth and if we get this thing working I promise all of you I'll work with Greg to get something posted up there so we can see it actually work and see a finished schematic of what actually did work or if we couldn't get it to work I'll let you know that as well so thank you for taking the time to watch this video and again this is was a different format for me something different let me know if this is something you like and I'll do more things like this and if not well we'll go back to the way we always do things that's fine too anyway I wish you all well take care and we'll see you again real soon bye bye